On November 11, 1991, director John Frankenheimer was the guest on Later with Bob Costas. He was promoting his new film, Year of the Gun, but most of the conversation centered upon the always appropriate, always relevant Manchurian Candidate, a 1962 film starring Frank Sinatra that dealt with brainwashing from Chinese and Russian uh, foreign powers to infiltrate the United States. There are some that say Donald Trump is the Manchurian candidate. As Frankenheimer describes to Costas, both the extreme left and extreme right are just as far off the mark. It always will be. Frankenheimer also recounts the golden age of television when television broadcasts were live productions of programming and the whole process that lent itself to, in his opinion and most others, the highest quality television that ever existed artistically. So watch, watch this interview with one of the pioneers of, of television and one of the best filmmakers we've ever had, John Frankenheimer, and later with Bob Costas. Thanks for staying up later. The director, John Frankenheimer, is with us tonight. About a week ago, his new movie, Year of the Gun, opened nationwide. Give me the quick uh, thumbnail on this one, and what attracted you to this project? Well, Bob, it's a thriller. It's a conspiracy movie. I love conspiracy movies. It concerns an innocent man caught in this big conspiracy that he knew nothing about, yet he's the cause of it. And then he's, he's pressed into doing things that he never dreamed possible. He's put into impossible situations where he's running for his life. He has to use a gun for the only time in his life. It's also a movie about betrayal, about love, about the media. A lot of things that attracted me. See, I can't explain. When we talk about the overview of your career, I guess we have to start with the Manchurian candidate. I mean, this is, I, I think George Axelrod, who was the producer, said it's a movie that went from failure to classic without ever passing through success because the circumstances of this film are close to unique. Yeah, I disagree with George on that. I mean, the, the thing is that I think it had a moderate success when it came out in 1962. Certainly not the success it had in the reissue. It, it was a movie that, that was wonderful to make and I loved making it and I was thrilled at the acclaim that it got when it came out again. As you say, it is unique. It doesn't usually happen with a movie. Here's a guy played by Lawrence Harvey who's been brainwashed along with uh, a bunch of his compatriots, brainwashed by uh, Chinese and Russian communists and uh, certain suggestions planted in his head and the notion is that at the right time these uh, hypnotic suggestions can be triggered and he can be made to do their bidding including a political assassination. Frank Sinatra kind of vaguely recalls what's gone on. Did people grasp it right off the bat? Well, Bob, the answer to that is some people did. A lot, some of the audience was confused, but the main person that was, the main group of people that were confused was United Artists, the distributor. Uh, they never totally believed in the movie. They never believed in the movie enough to support it. Sinatra sank two, three million of his own money into this, and he had the distribution rights. And after JFK was assassinated in 63, as I understand the story, he felt that this would have been tasteless and inappropriate. The movie is pulled, and uh, except for those who might have had a print, nobody saw it for more than 20 years. Yeah, that's more or less true, Bob. It wasn't pulled because it had already run its, 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 its it, it had come out in 62 and had had its release, and in those days, the next step was network television and yeah. syndication, and then it went into the old movie shelf. But what happened with Manchurian is after President Kennedy's assassination, there were those that wanted to exploit the picture uh, by re-releasing it. We all said no. I mean, that was not a tough decision to make. And then, as you say, it just wasn't seen for a long, long time. And finally, after the arrival of all the ancillary markets, like tape and cable, United Artists said, uh, well, we'd like to re-release the picture. And we asked to see some kind of a financial statement. Mm -hmm. They had us so far in debt that if they had re-released the picture and we had been E.T., we would have lost money. <laughs> so they would have made a fortune, but we would have lost. So 
we were able to finally, a management was in place long enough about three years ago to negotiate a deal where we were at least even with the sheet when we came out again. And they said, okay, now we're going to put the, mo the movie into uh, the video stores. And Sinatra said, hey, wait a minute. He said, I think there's a real market for this out there. Uh, a whole generation of people have never seen this movie. They've heard about it. I think, and we, George and Axelrod, Axelrod and I agreed with him, uh, that yes, there is a market for re-release. United Artists said, well, we don't share your belief, and beside that, it would cost us $2 million to find out, and we're not ready to spend the $2 million. And Sinatra said, well, you don't have to. Here's a check for $2 million. He said, no, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. He said, re-release it theatrically. And they did, and it was a success. And there's, I may not recall this exactly right, but there are scenes where you try to capture for the audience what this brainwashing was like and how these guys' minds were being played with, where they all kind of dream or they go through flashback that's sequences. Right. And the impetus for it is the thought that's been planted in their head. But the thought has to go through their own experiences and their own mindsets. That's right. Uh, there was some church social or something. Yeah, it was, a, it was a gathering of a ladies' garden club at a New Jersey hotel, and the chairperson, the chairwoman, was talking about hydrangeas. And some hilltops. And then we went back into the Manchurian amphitheater where the Chinese psychiatrist was talking about brainwashing these people and explaining that they were thinking that they were in a garden seminar in New Jersey. When Manchurian Candidate first came out, I imagine people interpreted who they were supposed to think the villains were differently. I mean, it's clear that the Chinese guys and the Russian guys who, who brainwashed Lawrence Harvey and Sinatra and the rest, they were the, they were the enemies. But I guess people could perceive it as being right-wing extremism or left-wing extremism that was at work. Yeah, I think they could. And what this movie infuriated so many people by saying was that taken to the extreme, the far left becomes exactly the same as the far right and vice versa. They're going to meet around the corner. Exactly. We had both groups picketing outside the movie theater. As my friend George Axelrod would say, wouldn't it be better if they were picketing inside the movie theater after having bought tickets? <laughs> you know, but they were both out there. We had, we had riots outside the movie theater from both extreme left and extreme right groups. In the case of Manchurian Candidate, you've got one that ranks as, as a classic, will be talked about for years and years. But then you've had a period of time where after a lot of success, you more or less disappeared as from the front ranks of directors for a long period of time, and you personally disappeared a little bit, right? Yeah, I had a bad time. I had a very, very bad time. And I think I'm out of it now. It's, I've been out of it for about 10 years. And uh, yeah, I did. I, I, I went through a lot of depression and... Um, it, 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 it was not a good time, and I, but now it is a good time. I mean, I feel real good about myself and about my life and about my career and about what's in front of me. Anyone can tell, seeing you sitting here, that you're still vital. What do you think the future holds for you as a director? Or can you get to a situation where you've been out of that front rank so long that you'd need a major hit to get back in contact with the kind of material you really need to have in your hands to have to do another superlative bit of work? Well, I don't want to judge my own work, but I think that that isn't the case. I think that I've gotten that material in Year of the Gun. I think Year of the Gun is a very good movie. And, uh, I mean, I've, I've managed to stay up there so that I get really kind of good material. What do you think, what do I think the future holds for me? I can only tell you what I hope it hopes for me, holds for me, that I'll be able to keep doing this that I'll be able to keep directing movies for a lot more years. I mean, I love directing movies. I think I'm a better movie director now than I was 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago. And um, I have, um, I'm very optimistic about my own future. We're back now with the director, John Frankenheimer. When you walked into the studio to sit down for the interview, you said, I did a number of shows in the 50s here in studio 8H. 8H. Yeah. That's where you got your start as a director in television rather than films, right? Absolutely. In live television. I was, um, I started in 1953 as an assistant director, and in 54 I started to direct. And I did that for six and a half years. I did a lot of television shows. Some of the classic early shows, Playhouse 90 and uh, You Are There, the Walter Cronkite yeah. thing. Person to Person with Edward R. Morrow? Yeah, I was an assistant director on Person to Person. I did Climax, I did Mama, Studio One, and Playhouse 90, as you say, and Ford Star Time for NBC, and a few others. 
it must have been exhilarating because unlike a film where you can cut it again or, or, even, or even a stage production, you're, you're in a, a confined space, you've got to hit every mark exactly, and it's live and everybody's seeing it. Yeah, that's the, that's the downside of it. The upside of it is that uh, unlike a sporting event, or a news documentary type of thing, we had a lot of time to rehearse. We knew exactly what we were doing. We could read the thing, we, we had it uh, blocked out in rehearsal halls, so that by the time we got into a studio like the one we're in now, 8H, uh, we knew exactly what we wanted to do. The cameramen were superb, just absolutely superb. And we were, we were too young to know we couldn't do it. So we tried all kinds of wonderful things, and sometimes they worked. Can you recall an example of where you went out on a limb and a limb broke? Well, Bob, I was very, very lucky. The limb only broke once, um, and it was very early in my career. I did about 150 of these things, and I really only had technically one disaster. It was a show on Climax called, um, <laughs> prophetically, The First and the Last. It was an um, adaptation of a John Galsworthy novel. It took place in Victorian England. And it concerned two brothers, one older, who was about to become the Lord Chief Justice of England, very cold, unemotional man. The other guy was kind of a rastabout playboy and so forth and so on, who was always getting involved with women. And mm -hmm. the story has it that he got involved with this married woman. And the husband came in and found them at it. And he, uh, in, in self-defense, killed the husband. Well, I wanted, because we were doing a thing called Climax, which was kind of based on the fact that we would get kind of B Hollywood names to do these parts. And I wanted an actor who was a very, very fine stage actor and a very good movie actor, too, Herbert Marshall, to do the cold, unemotional brother. And since we needed kind of a Hollywood name, I wanted Louis Hayward to do the, uh, to do the other brother. Mm -hmm. And um, I went away to Palm Springs for the weekend, which was a mistake. I got back and the CBS executives met me in the hallway and said, have we got news for you? I said, well, what is it? And they said, well, we decided that Herbert Marshall wasn't a big enough star, so we've cast Robert Newton in the part. Now, Robert Newton, as you recall, made his whole career on playing Cockney drunks in Odd Man Out and a lot of other movies. Uh -huh. And I said, well, uh, what part is he going to play? because I thought maybe he'd be playing the rag picker. And they said, well, we've got him as the cold, unemotional brother. And I said, well, my God, I said, he can't do that. They said, no, you don't understand. They said, that's offbeat casting. I said, okay, now let's get on with this. I said, who's going to play the brother? And they said, well, you know, that isn't really a very, very good part. And we couldn't get Louis Hayward for that. I said, well, who do you have? They said, well, we got John Agar for it. Now, John Agar was married to Shirley Temple, and that was his only claim to fame. <laughs> and I said, but, you, I said, but wait a minute, I said, John Agar comes from Kansas, and this guy's supposed to be English, and he's supposed to be Robert Newton's brother. I said, how can we justify that? And they said, don't worry about it, we've got that all figured out. He went to Canada, you see, and joined the Canadian Merchant Marine, which is why he has this accent. And I said, okay. <laughs> so now we start... We start to rehearse You should this. never have gone to Palm Springs. Bob, I've never been since. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what happened is we start to rehearse, and it becomes painfully obvious that Agar is never going to get through this. And not only that, Newton is, is really, really, really upset. And he comes to me one day, <clears throat> and in his Cockney accent, he looks at me, he says, he says, he says, oh, boy. I said, yes. He says, what happens if I blow? I said, what do you mean, Bobby, if you blow? He said, well, you know. He said, what happens if I, if I forget me lines? He says, is there a prompter? I said, no. I said, there's no prompter. But I said, Bobby, you're not going to forget your lines. Everything's going to be fine. He looked at me and said, oh, like that. Agar came to me the next day, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, he said, I've got to tell you something. I said, what? He said, I can't act. <laughs> well, what you wanted to say is no what else is new? But you didn't. <laughs> ah, you said, and he said, I'm never going to get through it. He said, I'm never going to get through it. I said, you're going to get through it just fine, John. You're going to get through it just fine. Well, in reality, what happened was that there was a long, long scene, especially for live television, in a room, somewhat like this, only bigger, where the younger brother came to the older brother to tell him, <clears throat> to tell him the news, and the younger brother had two speeches in the scene, one at the beginning of the scene and one at the end that were similar but not the same. 
And the whole thrust of the scene was the older brother had to ask about this girl. And he has to say, does the girl know about me? And the answer is yes. And then they have to go into the whole theme of the show, which is blackmail. Well, of course, what happened, you know what happened, is Agar got into the scene and he gave him the last speech in the scene instead of the first speech. Mm. So now we cut to this close-up of Robert Newton. And Newton looked like right then and there that he was going to do the network identification for us <laughs> because his eyes were just like that. And he said very slowly, he said, did you tell her about me? And we cut to Agar, who by this time was in Mars. And he says, no. And we cut to Newton, and he says, oh. And he walked right off the set. I mean, he was going home. So now Agar was standing over by the fireplace, and we cut to him right away. And he's looking at Newton walking off the set like that. And he, we saw he was about to go. And the cameraman said to me, he said, what do I do? I said, pin him to the wall. And we pushed the camera right in so that he couldn't move. And there was this huge distorted close-up of him from coast to coast. And we grabbed Newton, or the stage people grabbed Newton, and threw him back into the chair like this. And we cut to him as he landed, and we pushed Agar over. And they somehow or other babbled through some semblance of a scene, leaving out the whole plot of the show. And the next scene was out on the street. We had no budget, so the, next st the, the, the street was a lamppost with fog machines. And we had all the marks on the floor and all that kind of stuff. Well, of course, the cue to start the fog machine was in the scene that was never played. So when Newton walked out on the street, all we had was a lamppost looking down and all the marks, the cameras, and everything else. As soon as the special effects man saw this, he knew something was wrong, so he pushed the fog machine full bore. And what happened was that you had these things going like that. It looked like Cape Canaveral, you know, Cape Kennedy in the television studio. And uh, he, Newton then walked into a hotel room, and of course all the fog was in the hotel room at this point. You could, the actors couldn't see each other, and they were coughing and, and so on and so on. Anyway, <clears throat> to make a long story short, we ended up seven and a half minutes short. Seven and a half minutes short, which on a live television show is disastrous. Yeah. And what happened was that I just put up the credits, and when it came to the person responsible for this casting, I put his credit on the screen for six minutes. <laughs> really? Six minutes, <laughs> yeah. And he was in the control room screaming, yelling, get that, get that card off, and I wouldn't get it off. Anyway, I expected my career to be over. I was 25 years old, and I said to my wife, I said, it's finished. I mean, we're going to go back and try and get another job. Well, the reviews the next day were interesting but somewhat confusing show on Climax. You know, they just never totally caught it. When people talk about the golden age of television, you think they're giving it too much credit? Are they just remembering, maybe as they do with ball players, the guys who went to the Hall of Fame and not everything that surrounded it? So they remember Playhouse 90 and they remember you were there, but it really wasn't any better overall than it was at any other time in, in the medium's history? Oh, hell yes it was. Was it? Yeah. I mean, we really did a lot of good stuff. And we were able to... I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a great time. And we all knew that we were doing kind of really... that we were very privileged. Uh, and I have my theories as to why it was good. Um, one of them is that during that particular time, I mean, the blemish on the whole time was the blacklist. Let's start from there. I mean, that was horrible. It was horrible to go through it. But <clears throat> you see, not everybody in the United States owned a television set. You were playing to a rather elite audience because your, your audience was much better educated than today's audience. I think you were playing to much more of an audience type of person that would watch this show, for instance, that we're doing right now, that, would, that subscribes to cable, that tunes into PBS. Uh, and when the whole war of the ratings really started, that's when we started to get in trouble. I mean, our, our ratings weren't as good as something like Ed Sullivan or... or, or or Tennessee Ernie Ford or something like that. And eventually, when Jim Aubrey came into CBS in 1960, he just took all that stuff off the air. There's a, something which we'll call Frankenheimer's Law that goes something like this. The better television is in a country, 
the worse the movie industry is. Or maybe I've got them backwards. No, the worse the movie industry right. is, then the better you can count on television. Being. No, you had it perfectly right the first time. I believe that. I mean, when I say the worse the movie industry is, the, 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 you don't do as much business because people stay and watch television, which for years was why we did such lousy business in England because the BBC and their, their television is so good. And we still do, for the most part, lousy business in England. And for years, France had the worst television in the world. And it was the best movie country. And that's changing. I mean, the television in France is getting a lot better. Yeah, but I think that works, Bob. I mean, the better the quality is that people can see at home, the less they're going to go to the movies. Half hour we spent with John Frankenheimer. His new film, Year of the Gun, is playing at a theater near you. We're going to tape another show, and you'll see it in a few weeks as we cover some of the films like Grand Prix and uh, Birdman of Alcatraz, Black Sunday, Seven Days in May. Some of the films in John Frankenheimer's past that we didn't have time to cover in this half hour. Hope you'll be with us then, and until then, Thanks for watching Cleveland Live Music. It's awfully bright out here. I'd click on another one of my videos. Quit looking into the sun. Your mother told you not to do that. Please hit the subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel more, there's GoFundMe and Patreon information in the video descriptions. Ooh, ooh!